there was nothing. Until God said, now is the time. And suddenly, something. So many things, stars and seas, birds and trees. And so there was creation. Until God said, now is the time. And suddenly, a man, a woman, shaped in his image, made from the earth in his breath, separated by sin nonetheless. And so there were humans. Until God said, now is the time. And suddenly, a savior, a baby, a son, sent to reunite us and to save everyone. Until God says again, now is the time. On Sunday morning, the alarm goes off. Working the nine to five, but at what cost? Staring at our phones, looking for a picture to post and dose off. Just to let everyone think we're all right. All the while wondering, is there more to life? We're walking out paces with all the other stranger faces. Checking off the things that make us good people. Treat others equal, don't be deceitful, but is there more to life? Just like before, we can hear God implore. Now is the time for hope and connection. Enough for seclusion and rejection. Now is the time for resurrection, for starting over. Enough for the shame. Now is the time to shout and proclaim. I believe there is more. What are you waiting for? It's yours and it's mine. Now is the time for more than just me. Now is time for us and we. Now is time for God's family. You can't find it alone. And it goes beyond things that are known. Now is the time to see you are loved. No more pressure, no measure. We're better together. Now is the time to share tragedies and victories with others. No more wondering. No more wandering. Here, there is only belonging. Now is the time. That'll get you fired up. Good morning, Radiant Church. How you doing out there? Let's hear it. Oh, come on. <laughs> now is the time. It's the time for the church to step up, to engage the culture, to make a difference. But if that's going to happen, we're going to have to relook at some things, and we're probably going to have to ask that question we don't often like to ask in our lives. But it's an important question. That question is this. Are we doing the right things? Or even more importantly, the things we're doing, are they working? Not only as a church do we have to ask that, but even in our lives we need to ask that question at, at times. These things I'm doing, these routines that I can get in, are they making a difference? Are they helping? Are they hurting? Are they really doing what I wanted them to do? Am I accomplishing the thing that I wanted to accomplish? When it's the new year, it's a time for us to just ask those questions whether that's in your life, but even as a church, we've got to ask that question. Is it working? These things we're doing, is it working? Is it accomplishing what we think it should be accomplishing? About two months ago, I had the opportunity to sit in a room with about 30 other pastors from across the United States, just kind of a think tank, asking questions, discussing various things. Before the whole thing got started, one of the pastors got up and said, I recently started a church in the San Francisco area where less than 3% of the people go to church. I went, wow. Another one got up and says, I'm planting a church in the Seattle area where less than 3% of the people go to church on a regular basis. A couple other pastors said the same thing, but the one that caught my eye was the one from New York City. He said, I'm, I'm launching a, a church in New York City where less than 1% of the people go to church on a regular basis. I thought, wow. Their point, though, is they, they started looking at pastors like me and several others, uh, particularly ones that are maybe in the heartland and from a little bit smaller cities, and they said, listen, I'm guessing where you do ministry that that number is somewhere around 8 to 9%. And as I thought about it, and from what I understood from the data, they're right. It, it is about 8 to 9% of people in Des Moines attend church on a regular Sunday uh, weekend. And, and, and so the point, though, they were making was if the trends continue, if things keep looking the way they're looking, in 10 years, that number for you will be at 3% as well. This country is becoming more and more secular and more and more like Europe. That's the current situation. And what's interesting is I looked out on a, a group of people that measure these things. They come out with a report every year, and it happened to just come out this last week. And, and one of the things they measure is the most unchurched cities in America, the, the places where people are going to church less and less. 
And it might interest you to know that in America, there's over 19,000 incorporated cities that exist. And of that 19,000 or more, Des Moines ranks number 38 as one of the most unchurched cities in America. That's down too from a couple years ago where we were number 40. We're moving in the wrong direction. And to give you an idea of what company we're with when we're ranked that way, on one side at, at 37 is San Diego, on the other is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What used to be on the coast, and we used to say, well, that's kind of an East Coast or a West Coast thing, has now made its way to the heartland. It's a very real reality. Fewer and fewer people are going to church in our culture. In fact, if I had to take all of the data and summarize it in one statement, it would be this. In 24 years, there's been a 15% drop in regular church attendance across the United States. Throughout the U.S., some more in places, some less, whatever it may be, but overall, there's been a 15% drop in regular church attendance throughout the United States. Now, it's easy to look at that and probably think, oh, am, am I a doomsday or am I just trying to give bad news? Not, not what we're trying to do here. And no, I don't see this as a failure because the question I get a lot of times is people will say, well, then is the church dying in America? And the short answer is no. The church is not dying in America, but the church is changing. And we need to be aware of the changes, not only in the church but in the culture around us, we need to be the people of our times and engage those changes and be asking the question, what does it mean to continue to build bridges with the culture and make a difference in the community in which we exist? What needs to change with us if we're going to engage this culture, this next generation, this group coming up and say that there is hope and healing through Jesus Christ? What is it going to be to build Christ's church where we are? Those are the questions we're going to have to ask. Now, when we start to answer that question, immediately one verse comes to mind. And for some of you who have maybe been in church for a while, you've probably seen this verse several times. That verse is Matthew 28, verse 19. In that verse, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, therefore, go. In other words, don't hang out together. Don't be huddled around each other. Get out. Get outside the walls, go into the community, go into the world, go and do what? Make disciples. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. These are part of Jesus' last words before he goes back up into heaven. And in many ways, you know, in our culture, we like, to, we like to have business terms. We like to say, you know, does the church have a vision statement? Does it have a mission statement, core values, things like that? And, and it does. But if someone were to look at me and say, did Jesus ever give the big church throughout the world a mission statement? I would say, you betcha he did. It's right there. Jesus said, your mission, the thing you're supposed to be doing is to go and make disciples of all nations. No matter what our mission statement is or any other church's mission statement, underneath that mission statement is this verse. This is our marching orders as a church. Go and make disciples of all nations. But when I think of that word make on there, I immediately kind of put on my engineering hat. Immediately I start thinking, well, if we're going to make something, then we have to build machinery. Or, or if we're going to produce something, you're going to have systems and processes. There's, there's something intentional that makes this thing, and you've got to put that thing in place. And, and, and kind of to give you an example on that as I was working through it, is, is I said, you know, let's say I made a machine. And I created that machine and, and, and taught it how to melt plastic and, and, and to mold that plastic into a circular form, a tube like this. And, and let's say that machine had the ability to take little ball points and put it on the end of it. And, and, and it also had the ability to inject ink into a, a smaller tube inside the big tube. And, and it puts all of that together. And at the end of the day, it creates a ballpoint pen, a workable good ballpoint pen. 
How unusual, though, would it be if I looked at you and said, but wait a minute, I wanted to make a pencil. I really wanted a pencil. I would think you'd look at me somewhat odd. I would think you'd start to ask some questions to me. I, I think you would say, well, if you wanted to make a pencil, why didn't you create a machine that makes pencils? Why would you expect a machine that makes pens to make pencils? Now, hold on to that thought for a minute. I'm going somewhere with that. What's interesting about that group of pastors I was sitting with a couple months ago is this. After they got up and, and mentioned the fact that fewer and fewer people were going to church, about three or four of them immediately just chimed in and kind of said, you know, the reason this is happening, the problem with the church throughout America, because they've got the answers, you know, uh, the, the reason this is happening is because the church is full of consumers. The church just has a bunch of consumers and spectators in the pews. Now, if you're not familiar with what the term consumer means when we're talking about that, a consumer is a person who shops churches for the goods and services they provide that has what they need. And if they have what they need, they may consider investing in that. And if the church does not have what they need, they take their business somewhere else. That is what consumers are, and that's at the core of the definition of consumers. And when we say out there that the church throughout America, I'm not talking about right here, I'm just churches throughout America is full of consumers, we are absolutely 100% correct. We've been talking about that for years. That is not new information. That is a very real thing and a very real reality in the American church. It's full of consumers. But what hit me in that conversation for the first time was this pen and pencil illustration. Because what I realized was this. We're sitting there and we're bemoaning the fact as leaders of the church, hey, there just seems to be a whole bunch of consumers sitting in the church. But I wondered if we had created them. I wonder if we had created the machinery wanting to produce a pencil, but it was producing Pens. I wonder if the reason that we have a bunch of consumers sitting out in the audience is because we created the machinery to produce consumers and they have become exactly what we created them to be. In the end, what I'm saying is, what if it's my fault? We're sitting there and challenging them and saying, how dare them? But what if we created the very machinery that created the very product that we wanted to produce. In other words, let's say I wanted to make pencils, but I created a machine to make pens. Whose fault is it then? Let me dive in a little deeper by what I mean about that and explain. About 40, 50 years ago, the culture in America and the church was changing. People who had once gone to church, whether they had gone as children or were going, decided a large number of them, I don't think I wish to go to church anymore. And there were various reasons for that, but some of which is because church just seemed to become boring and stale. And so they, they just weren't going. A group of young pastors and people who understood their time says, well, we got to do something about this. We're going to have to engage this thing that's happening and so they came in and said, we need to rethink church. We need to do church a little bit differently. And, and so things began to change. Pastors took their ties off and their sport coats off. And I'm thanking Jesus for that every day. So, you know, pastors wearing cool hip clothes now. We got rid of the hymnals, got some projectors and started playing rock and roll music. Kids ministry, we hired specialists and we brought them in and we put on a full-blown production back there to try to compete with everybody else in town. And everything at that point began to be about the weekend show, about putting on a weekend production in which you had to compete with the other churches in the area because they were putting on a production too. And this weird tension formed. It's like, who's got the better show? Who's doing the better thing? And some things happened that I don't think we planned on. We used this formula that said, hey, great teaching, great music, great kids, and you will grow. But a couple things happened I don't think we were counting on. The first 
phenomenon that happened is this. We began to create a group of people called shoppers. See, because it was about the show, and it was about putting on the better show, and impressing people, and providing the goods and services through, through programs and events, and, and, and just providing the smorgasbord of stuff to say, hey, aren't we better than someone else? Because we did that, we created a group of people called shoppers. And what do they do? They shop from one church to the next to find the one that provides them with the goods and services they need to grow in Jesus Christ. And it didn't work. And at the core, that's called consumerism. Consumerism is when we shop. And here's what you need to know. This is a completely foreign idea to the first century church. It is a modern phenomenon. It was foreign to the church for centuries. This idea that you would go out and you would shop for a church that provides you with the things that make you happy. Because what we learned is the early church, the church didn't exist for them, they existed for the church. And there's a big difference, but we reversed that in the last 40 to 50 years. And as a result, we've created a phenomenon of shoppers and consumers out there for which I just want to say, I'm sorry. I'm one of those leaders who's been leading the last 20 years. It's our fault. We created the machinery. It produced exactly what it was supposed to produce. We wanted pencils. We got pens. It's our fault. And the problem is, at first, this approach of doing church looked like it was working. From the outside, it looked like it was working because we created a second phenomenon the church had never seen before. That phenomenon was called the megachurch. You see, in 1960s, there was only a handful of megachurches, large churches out there. Today, there are hundreds of churches that have attendance of 3,000, 5,000, and well beyond that. It's a new phenomenon that we've not seen before. And as a result of this, we applauded them, and, and we should. I think it's great that people be reached for Jesus any way they can, but we applauded all of the methods, and we said, listen, everybody out there, you've got to do church this way. You've got to get out there and you've got to preach a certain way and the pastor's got to be a celebrity. You need to go out there and hire that worship person that's got a top 40 hit on radio. Pay anything you can to get that person inside of your church. You've got to put on a carnival back there in kids ministry that, that gets their attention and makes them scream to come back next week. It's just got to be this huge production. You've got to do that weekend and week out. And if you do this, you will grow. But here's the problem. The culture didn't. 15% fewer people are going to church in the last 24 years. Something's not working. And you say, well, what happened? It could be a long conversation, but I, I, I think this is one example of what has happened. In 2003, a report came out that said between 4,000 and 7,000 churches close their doors every year in America. Tom Rayner, He's a leadership development guy. He says in a recent article entitled 13 Issues for Churches in 2018, between 8,000 and 10,000 churches will likely close this year. That's a lot. More and more churches are closing. And can we just be honest with each other for a minute? All we ended up doing is taking those Christians who decided not to abandon the church and shuffle them to other places that put on the better show. That's all we did. We ended up just shuffling Christians around to where there is a better show. Meanwhile, our culture, fewer decisions for Jesus, fewer disciples being made, less and less people going to church. We were using the wrong measuring sticks and measuring success the wrong way. It looked like it was working, but it wasn't. And so if you ask me, you say, what bothers me? This bothers me. Even some of my friends, staff, even in the last few months, they can kind of just tell, they're like, something's bothering you. Something's eating at you. What is it? It's this. 
It's asking that question, is this working? This thing we're doing and how we're doing it, is it effective? Are we doing the right things? Because I don't want to be doing the wrong things. I don't know about you. I've just been wrestling, and I've been really struggling. For 40 years, we've just had the idea in the church that says, if we do the weekend well, if we open our doors, people will come. That's the formula. Do the weekend well. Open your doors, and people will come. But it's not working, and things have changed. You say, well, what's changed? I can give you a pretty good start on what's changed. We talked about the fact that 40, 50 years ago, a group of people made a conscious decision to say, I no longer want to go to church. Now, they could have been raised in church, but even back then, the culture had an understanding Sunday was for church. I know growing up, even at a young age, most businesses were still closed on Sunday. You did not have sports programs on Sunday. Even the community still kind of understood that Sunday was this Sabbath rest day for the church. And so if people didn't go to church, by and large, they knew the church existed and they were making a decision not to go. Fine. But what happened is this, those people had kids and then they had grandkids. And those next generations that were born, they had no memory of the church. Their parents did not take them to church. Their parents did not talk to them about church. Church was irrelevant in their life. It had no meaning. There's nothing inside of them that would make them say, I need to go to church on Sunday because they don't even know what the church is. And to think that they're just going to wake up and say, hey, I think I need to go to church today is absurd. Church had no meaning to them. They weren't raised with an understanding of what church is. And this, by the way, parents, is why it's so important to bring your kids to church. We've got an entire generation out there that isn't refusing to go to church. They just don't know church exists or why it's important for them. It has no meaning to them. I want to share a couple of quotes with you to kind of let you know other people are kind of in this conversation as well, too. Other people are struggling and wrestling with this. And the other reason I want to share these quotes is so you don't think I've completely lost my mind or I'm having a midlife crisis. So we're just going to kind of look over a couple of quotes, but I really want you to pay attention to these because I think they're the key to really understanding what's going on here. The first one's by a guy named J.D. Greer. He said, I lived in a Muslim country for several years. And I was friends with dozens of people who went to the mosque weekly. Interesting what he says. At no point did I consider going with them. I wouldn't have gone for a special holiday. I wouldn't have gone if I were facing hard times. I wouldn't have gone if the imam were doing a really helpful series on relationships or if he told really funny stories that helped me see how Allah was relevant to my life. I wouldn't have gone if they'd added percussion and a kick in electric guitar to the prayer chants. Islam was completely foreign world and one in which I knew I clearly didn't belong. So I didn't go. No reason. For this person in that country, Islam didn't mean anything to them. They weren't being disrespectful. They weren't being rude. They weren't being rebellious. It had no relevance in their life. And just because they decided to do things a little differently and modernize it, that didn't change this person's perspective. This is the culture we live in today. A culture that has no memory of church. A culture that has a culture that doesn't understand why they would get up on a weekend and go to church. It just doesn't have any meaning in their life. And so I love what the next person had to say. And it's so important. Tim Chester, he says, that means that new styles of worship will not reach them. Fresh expressions of church will not reach them. Better programs and more events will not reach them. Great first impressions will not reach them. Churches meeting in pubs will not reach them. The vast majority of unchurched and de-churched people would not turn to the church even if faced with difficult personal circumstances or in the event of national tragedies. It is not a question of improving the product. It means reaching people apart from meetings and events. 
And there lies the key. It means reaching people apart from the meeting's event. It's not about improving the product. It's not about doing the weekends better. It's not about having more chili cook-offs. Not about having more egg hunts. These things aren't bad, but if we're relying on those to reach the next culture, not working. Not going to connect with them. I'm bothered by that. Because everything as a pastor I was trained to do at a young age was that. Do your weekends really well. Better than others. Throw as many big events as you can. Get people together as often as you can. And if you do that, you will make disciples and it's not working. It's not working anywhere in the United States. And it's not working here in Des Moines. So let's dive into our so what moment, if we could. What does all of this mean? What is it you're trying to say here, Jason? Where is this going? Now, if I think I had to summarize it and just be real with you and be raw and throw it out there, here's what it means to me. I'm tired of the show. that weekend thing that we spend so much energy doing that's not working. I'm tired of putting on a production and a show. And inevitably, I get it. Someone's going to come to me and go, oh, does that mean you're not going to care about what happens on the weekends and it's going to stink? No, that's not what we're saying. I'm talking about releasing the pressure valve on the expectation that it has to be this perfect production and show. What I'm talking about is I want it to be authentic. And authenticity means this. If I'm being authentic with you, I'm being real and I am being transparent with you. And if I am being real and I am being transparent with you as my friend, I won't give you junk. And if we're being real and we're being transparent with God, we will always bring him our best. Always bring him our best. What we have to ask is, what are our motives for doing this? Is it to give God our best, or is it to put on a show? I'm tired of the show, and I'm tired of doing things that don't work. I am passionate about people becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. I lose sleep over that. That's what gets me up in the morning. People who are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. So I'm tired of the show. I'm tired of measuring success by old measuring sticks that don't seem to be working. I want to make a difference, and I hope you do too, in the community in which we live. I want other people to build relationships with people. But ultimately what I'm saying is I'm tired of spending countless hours on putting on a show on the weekend when I've stepped back and asked the question maybe you're not supposed to ask, which is what if I took a whole bunch of those hours and invested into people? What if instead of this hyper focus on everything has to be about the show, we stepped back and said, we need to take some of those hours because I don't know about you, I'm busy. Life is busy. Anybody out there busy? Your time is limited. And we have to ask ourselves, what is the best use of our time? Not just in our lives, but as a church. And I think I'd like to grab some of those hours that were put trying to make a production. And I think I would like to challenge us as a church and ask you this question. It's a question you're going to hear for the next year. Who is your one? What do I mean by that? What I mean is this. Who is that one person you are discipling? That's how the early church grew. I can't find a scripture where Jesus walked up to anybody and said, what kind of teaching, music, and kids ministry would you like? I don't see it. Jesus was all about making disciples. 
and we have to be about making disciples. You want to know what the key is to reach the next generation, and you want to know what the key is to reach out to your community, how to make disciples, and how the church will grow. It will be through relationships, not events. It will be through you investing one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And, and let me be clear here. When I say who's your one, that one is not sitting in this room. Most of the people in this room are already disciples. I don't need you to make them a disciple. I need you to go out there and find someone who is far from Jesus Christ, who doesn't know him, and say, this is my one. I'm going to introduce somebody to Jesus and help them become more and more like him. That's what discipling is. And so when I ask the question, who is your one? What I'm saying is, who's that person outside the church that you are introducing to Jesus? And right about now, a bunch of you got uncomfortable. But that's how the early church grew. And if we're going to stop this trend, if we're going to be the people of our times and engage the culture, and say we can't just keep doing the same old things the same old way and expect different results. You're going to have to pray and ask yourself, who's my one? What would happen if every one of us had our one and was helping them become more like Jesus Christ? We have been called out of the world in order to make disciples, and so we all need to be asking that question, who is are one. And maybe in the church for a while, you've been feeling kind of uncomfortable, unsettled. Maybe you've been asking some of the questions I've been asking and saying, something doesn't seem right. Something's got to change. Well, welcome to the conversation. That's true. And that's what this series is about. That's why we're casting this vision. That's why it's so important. I 100% absolutely believe God is calling Radiant to this time and that you are not here by accident for us to look and see that things have changed, to understand the culture, to think about it, to make the adjustments, and to take this city for Jesus and make him famous. I absolutely believe that. You are not here by accident. All of us can make a difference, all hands on deck. But if we're going to do that, we're going to have to relook at some things and be willing to make some changes. I need you to ask, am I on board? Is that something I'm willing to do? But the bigger question I need you to wrestle with this week is this. I need you to ask yourself honestly and transparently, Am I a disciple or am I a consumer? Because if we're going to be a church that makes a difference in our culture, I need disciples making disciples who are making disciples. That's how the early church grows. And so you need you to wrestle with that. Does the church exist for you or do you exist for God's mission and his church?